I hate to break the fishing news up here, M. Chuck, but I'd like to speak about the ice hockey. Congratulations. You're one of the 13 listeners of the Real Life Podcast. We just traded a migraine in for, like, an orgasm. Might want to mark that down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All of my projects are on schedule until they're not. A member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. About as funny as we're going to get today. Welcome into episode... 260 of the Real Life Podcast. I'm Tyler Uramchuk. Jay's here. Chalmers is here as well. The Nation Network of Podcasts, and it is growing. We're going to get into that in just a second. Former NHL or hell, former NHL All-Star John Scott will join us in about 10, 15 minutes here. We're going to talk about his new partnership with The Nation and HockeyFights.com and his podcast. We'll talk about his career, all that good stuff. Before we get to that, though, Going to have some banter. Also need to let you know, this podcast is brought to you by Oodle Noodle. 14 locations in Edmonton for now because it is growing in the Edmonton area is getting a whole bunch more. We talked about that the other day on the podcast. Oodle Noodle, a proceed of all in-store and curbside pickup orders go towards local charities. If you don't want to go find a store, you can also find it on your favorite food delivery app. Jay Chalmers, you're both here. Uh, before we get to John Scott, I obviously want to talk a little Oilers, the 4 nothing loss on Saturday. To me, I look at it as sometimes you're going to lose games. Sometimes you're just not going to be the better team. I shrug it off. Jay, you got your hands in the air. You're just shrugging it off too? You know what? That game is just the cost of doing business. We're, we're still on an absolute heater. So, you know, we bounce back tonight and win. Then that, that's just part of the process. You're not going to win every single game. And when you look back the last 14 games, will be what 11 and three or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Like th- that's like, that's elite. So, you know, we can't win them all. Uh, we didn't show up on Saturday, a little fatigue from all that winning we've been doing. Uh, so not too concerned at this moment. Chalmers. Yeah, I got to agree. You know, I, I, I'm not too riled up about the loss, but, you know, they did look like a totally different team. Um, games before that, they were pulling off those little cute backhand passes. You know, guys always supporting, guys always there to pick up those passes. And the Maple Leafs were picking them off from us and quite easily. And um, it was just that flow. Like, you could just you could just feel the flow of the game was not in our favor. We weren't getting the bounces. And I'm not going to overreact to it. I would really like to see how they bounce back tonight. Unfortunately, you're disappointed because, you know, with McDavid out of the lineup or uh, Matthews out of the lineup, you know, you hope for a better result. But you know what? Like Jay says, you're going to lose games. And that's mm-hmm. not a bad one to lose. You know what I mean? You're not losing to a team that's right below you. You're losing to a team that's above you. And so yeah. if you're going to put, you know, if you're going to take an L, that was probably a better one than, than most to take. Yeah. Let's just see what happens tonight. Yeah, I mean, like if you lose tonight, then you're in a bit of trouble, I think, because then you're like, oh, your back's against the wall, because if you drop three in a row of the Leafs, you never want to be losing three and no, three in a row at any point in the schedule. But to me, like I described it on my pregame podcast today, there was no sizzle to their offense. It was just kind of like, yes, they had a lot of zone time. They outshot the Leafs at five on five. But like, do you remember a chance where you were like, damn, they should have scored on that one? Like there really weren't too many of those moments in the game. Uh, I thought that they had, like, they had, they had their chances. Well, like uh, what, Ennis saying, taking uh, a slap shot from the top of the circle? That's not really, like, a great eight Yeah, chance. yeah, I guess. But, like, they like they had their chances and when, you know, and sometimes there's some nights where they'll capitalize on them. But, yeah, you're right. They weren't, like, five-star, uh, uh, you know, opportunities yeah. uh, for them to, for tap-ins and whatnot. So, um, yeah, whatever. You know what? I, I was, was I amped up? and cracking open a few beers, hoping I was going to have a fun and wild Saturday night. Yes. Uh, and hoping the Oilers would deliver. Yes. And they didn't. So instead of having a fun night and cracking open a few more beers, I ordered don't arenate my feelings, but that is okay. Once in a while. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the Oilers made a, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out here. The Oilers made a move today picking up a goaltender in Alex Stalock, who was formerly with the Minnesota wild. I just saw this on Twitter at Oilers. John, you know what happened the last time the Oilers acquired a goalie from Minnesota in the middle uh, of the season? I saw that. That is, I got me so excited and just flashbacks from 06. 
Maybe uh, that's the key. You just always need a former wild goaltender on your team and you will make a playoff run now. But the O's picked up Alex Stalock today. For the people who are going, oh, what does it mean? It really doesn't mean anything. Like, I don't think this isn't like, a, oh, Koskinen's gone or like, oh, he's starting over Smith now. Like, this was just kind of, you needed a third goalie and he's actually a pretty good one. But maybe he's got, maybe through some weird twist of fate, he'll get a start and go on a rollison like run for the Edmonton Oilers. But I would not bet I'm, on that. I made a brain fart this morning because I thought Stalock was the same guy that uh, we traded um, Talbot to Philly for. Oh, you're thinking of Anthony Stolars. Stolar. So I t- immediately tweeted, like, welcome home or welcome back. And I saw your I tweet. Like, I was like, what? I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, is that the same guy? And I went and looked. I was like, shit. But I'm like, what was that guy's name? I swear that was his name. Stolars. There you go. Anthony Stolars. Chalmers, you're walking around in the backyard. Where are you going, man? Well, I told you that I, uh, I had to change venues for uh, this podcast because we have John Scott on. And um, I left my questions for him in my truck. So I just ran outside to get him. And now I'm going <laughs> back into the base. Are you hitting him with uh-huh. some stats, Chalmers? Is that why you have it written down? Well, not really stats. You know, I like to write my questions out so that I don't fumble my words when it's actually time to ask them. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's all I got. Preparation. No stats, no, yeah. no stats for him. You know, just a just a friendly conversation about things that have happened in his career that I have questions about. One of the pieces of broadcasting advice I once got, and I don't follow it because, again, I'm not a very good interviewer. That's always the thing uh, I, I'm kicking myself about. But I heard that you never write out a full question, just everything in short point form notes, because then when you ask the conversation or when you ask the question, it should sound more conversational. Um, so I got a few notes here that I've written down for the conversation with John Scott, but I'm excited. I got a few things like for me, the the fascinating thing about talking to guys who were NHL enforcers is that at some point in their career, they were not enforcers. At some point they had to make the decision to like, you know, flip the switch and go, fuck, if I want to stay in this league or in this level of hockey, I got to start beating the hell out of guys. And I'd love to know when that moment is for John Scott, because if I'm being honest, I'm looking through his stats and like, you know, even in college in junior B, like he never scored a ton. So at what point did John Scott go? If I want to make it to the next level, I need to start fighting a lot. Like I'm fascinated for that side of it. He racked up pims in college. And, you know, since there's no fighting in college, those are all two minute penalties. So he had to have had that element to his game and doing what he could, I guess, getting a lot of roughing penalties uh, through uh, through college. But uh, your end trick, I agree. I would like to know kind of when that decision was made or was he just always that guy? Should we get into the all-star game thing or have we already, has that been talked about enough? Everyone kind of knows the story. Chalmers, you're um, muted, so I'm sorry. I kind of was like wondering about that because, you know, like, there's the Kessel stuff, and then there's the yeah. All Star Game stuff. Has he not been asked that to death? You know, that's what I mean, right? I try, like it... Are we going to try to, yeah, try to ask him about stuff that he, you know he doesn't get asked on the podcast? I've always find that interesting when the guys are they get more engaged when you ask them about things that they've they don't get asked maybe, about a lot. Maybe there's something that happened at the All Star Game or from his experience there that, he, that maybe that might be unique that he could share. Not like, oh, how did you get the All Star Game? I think yeah. that's well documented and all. But maybe he's got like a crazy story or something. Uh, so it might be worth asking, does, kind of asking a question around that. Maybe not. Does he feel like he was the very first game stop in the NHL where everybody put their money behind something and he was and he got to a place that he yeah. might you know probably shouldn't have because you know it was kind of an internet an internet phenomenon. Well, we, uh, we transitioned at the right moment here because John Scott is rolling and ready to go. I guess we could call him a colleague now because he's officially a member of the nation network of podcasts. Drop in the gloves is now partnered up with hockeyfights.com. John Scott joins us on the pod. John, how's it going? Not bad, Tyler. Thanks for having me, man. Good, good to be here. Really excited. A member of eight NHL teams over your career, and now you're joining our podcast team. It's so depressing when I hear that. I'm like, eight teams? My gosh. People think I played for two decades, but no, it was only eight years. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Before before we get into your career and all that, let's start with the podcast partnership. I mean, John Scott partnering up with HockeyFights.com. That feels like a match made in heaven. 
it's just peanut butter and jelly. It just makes sense, right? It's so, so funny when you guys first reached out. I was really excited because literally when I was playing, I would be on hockeyfights.com for no kidding, like two, three hours a day, just researching fighters, trying to figure out how I'm going to handle these monsters. And when you guys reached out, I was like, this is perfect because I love this website. I go on it constantly and it makes perfect sense. So yeah, I, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. That's a funny thing. I like hockeyfights.com. Obviously the fans love it because it's quick. It's easy. You can watch all the fights whenever you want, but how big of an asset is it for a player like yourself who needs to fight for a living? Oh my gosh. You have no idea how often I would just be scouting. Like we're playing Steve McIntyre, Brian McGratton or George Peros or Colt Nor, those guys. I would literally freeze frame fights to try to look for tells on how these guys threw their first punch, how they went for their grab, what they did. Like well, I knew when I fought Matt Karkner, he'd come in heavy with the right bomb right away. Like regardless of who he's fighting or how he's fighting or if he's tired or fresh or what he's coming in with the haymaker right down the pipe. And I knew it. And he still belted me in the ear every time I fought him. And I was like, ah, so it, it was such a valuable asset that I, I don't think you guys realize how much fighters use your website. That's what I think is so funny about fighting. You know, you, you, just somebody who watches fights just thinks, well, there's only one way to go in it. You grab with your non-dominant hand and you throw with your dominant hand, right? But so like when you saw Kevin Bieksa coming with the Superman punch, what was your first, your first thought on that starting punch? It's just interesting because, yeah, everyone who starts a fight, they try to grab first. Like yeah. they initially go in with defense. And you, you saw it a few years back. I think it was Gord Downey who knocked out Jesse Bolarus with the one, but this is like 10, 15 years ago, but yeah, Bieksa knows this. He's a smart cat. He boxes, he knows what he's doing. So for him to come in and there's one punch Gudis with the Superman punch, like you're just expecting some guy to grab you by the collar. Like that's what you're expecting. And for him to do that, I don't know he, he's ahead of his game. Cause you've seen guys who try it. And if you miss that first punch, you're at such a disadvantage because you're <laughs> off balance. You're you're out of position and you're just going to get your lunch handed to you. So I don't know Bex is a tough cat, but that that's a, that's a risky move. I think sometimes people look at fighting in hockey and maybe the people who aren't diehard hockey fans or don't understand the sport too well, they look at it and they go, ah, oh, it's just barbaric. It's two guys just throwing their fists as fast as they can. But it really is for the guys who are professionals at it. Like you are, it's a science, right? Like there is so much strategy that kind of goes into how you're approaching each and every one. And they're all unique too. Yeah. Especially for a guy like me, because usually I would say 95% of my fights, the guys would go in and they would just play defense. So it was my goal to try to get these guys to just open up so we could trade. I, I loved fighting guys like Frazier McLaren or George Peros because it was, they would open up and we could just throw punches and it was fun. But yeah, it is a science where he's like, okay, I'm going to grab here. I'm going to try to angle you. I'm going to try to push my fist in your throat so you can't breathe so you have to you know lift your chin up a little bit and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it i worked with a guy in minnesota who really taught me some you know really unique ways to it's called breaking the wrist like they do in karate just to try to break a guy's grip because cam jansen i hated fighting him he would just grab my collar lock his head lock his arm out and hide his head and like this is the boringest fight ever cam and then he would throw one super like haymaker and it would brush my ear and he's like apparently won the fight. So it's just, uh, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. And it, I think it's taken away from fighting. I don't know if you, if you watch fights 20 years ago, they're so entertaining. It's well, just the one like, thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. There was no defense. Yeah. It was so fun to watch nowadays. Everyone's so worried about getting hit. It's just, it's brutal. Like the one thing I think you could teach guys these days is, is a lot to do with their, their footwork and their center of gravity. Cause what I've noticed in a lot of fights these days is guys are going down very fast and it's a lot because like this could lead into Lucic, but a lot of, a lot of, you know, some of the offense these days is just to get a guy off of his balance, but that really makes a guy fall down and the fight's over. Right. So you don't really end up doing that. So to really be able to like get your feet in a position where you can do circles and stay on your feet and throw punches is, is important. I'm just not seeing it as much. Well, no one, no one practices fighting anymore. It's a dying art. It's sad. I think it will come back just because I don't know the league cyclical, hopefully where we're at, we're at a low point and it'll eventually come back. Cause you see teams that are successful. They have guys who can throw, throw punches like Tampa Bay won last year. They had a heavy lineup. Vegas is doing well. They got a big body lineup. St. Louis won in a couple of years back. So you need guys who can get out there. Like the Bruins just picked up Jared Tenorti. As much as I don't like the guy, he serves a purpose. So it's uh, I don't think it's going to die, but like you said, 
no one fights anymore. So when you see a fight, they last so quickly because the people, they, they don't know how to fight. They grab a, a jersey and they're just like, I don't know what to do next. Like, I, I'm used to power skating, not, not fight. It's <laughs> Uh, t- talking about the podcast a little bit here, you know, we're getting into a few fights. That's something you plan to do. And uh, going forward here, is that going to be a part of the pod now that you're partnered up with hockey fights is reviewing fights, breaking them down, giving fans sort of a look at what's going on in the scrap. I think so. I'm going to take a lot of heat because everyone just thinks I'm just this terrible fighter who was tall. And that's the only way I, I made it into the show, which is, which is right. But there is a <laughs> science to it, like you said. And you know, there's ways to, I did it for gosh, 12 years. You know, I fought a lot and I've been around fighting. I was around some of the best fighters ever. Derek Bugard took me under his wing and taught me everything he knew and he knew. So I kind of know what I'm doing. And yeah, I think it'll be fun. Like I, I want to do one this week. I was thinking about Lucic and uh, Austin Watson. I think that was the perfect example of why fighting is so great. Ottawa was down to nothing. Austin Watson was trying to spark his team. He did not want to fight Lucic. He was out of his weight class by a good 40 pounds. And he stepped up to the plate. You know, he, he you know, he lost a fight. But Ottawa, you know, got a jump from it, came back, made it the game. And I think that's the perfect example of why fighting is so valuable. And Lucic, good on him for saying, yeah, let's, let's do this. I'll, uh, I'll take you behind the shed and beat the authority. But yeah, it was a good fight. <laughs> uh, I, think, when- I, think, I think that's something that's important that is missing, I guess, from the storytelling of hockey that used to be always told is like the backstory. Why is this happening? Or what happened two periods ago to lead to this? And I think that's something that I think it's important. That's an important thing that you're doing. So people can be educated and and not look at it just as like at the, on the surface, like, oh, these two animals are fighting each other, Ugh, violence. Like, no, there is a story there and there is a reason and a meaning behind it. And I think it's important. Uh, and I'm excited that you're going to be taking this, this angle with it. There is a lot of things that go into it. I'll never forget one of my first fights in the NHL. I was just um, up from Houston in Minnesota. We were playing Anaheim. George Peros was the tough guy in the NHL. Bugard was out, uh, shoulder, one of his injuries he had. We were down 3 nothing, And I'm like, gosh, I got to fight this guy. And so we line up. It was the start of the third period. We're down three rip, like I said. I'm like, you know, George, would you mind if we fought? And he looks at me. He goes, you know what? I shouldn't. I'll give you a go but you have to give me one, you know, in the next few years, whenever I asked you, you have to say yes. And I was like, yeah, you, uh, you better believe it. Like, let's do this. And we fought, I knocked him out. We came back, we won four, three in overtime. I was awarded first star of the game. And I only <laughs> played like seven minutes, but it was great. Cause like just this guy didn't have to fight and he was a reigning heavyweight champ. You know, I did a good, it was a good fight and uh, we came back and won. So it's just a cool backstory that no one ever sees. It's just, you know, it's just a blip on the radar when you look at the highlights, but it, it changed the momentum of a game. The one thing that, I- that favor. What's that? Sorry, did he cash in on that favor? Oh, without a doubt. I fought him plenty of times. Like, he would always like, hey, Johnny, remember that first fight? You owe me one. I'm like, all right, Georgie. You <laughs> You're got like, this it. is number four. Time. Like, enough is enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, one thing, the one thing that I always hear from fighters, and I'm, and I'm wondering if you are the same way, is that they go into a game and you know who you're about to play. You know who the tough guy on the team is. And you know you're probably going to have to fight him. Did you have like there's fear in fighting. There just always is. There's the nervousness. Did you have that nervousness or was most of the time when you got into those games, were you excited to get into that fight? Did you, you know, were you counting down the minutes till it happened or no terrified? Yeah, I I was terrified. And it's funny. I I do these charity events around Canada and USA and it's, it's mostly tough guys because we got, I think the most laid back personalities and maybe we just need the money. I don't know. So (laughs) it's like the George Peros and the, you know, George LaRocks and the Kelly chase and those guys. And every one of them, they're like, I was terrified. I, I I was terrified before every fight and I was the same way, but the fear goes away as soon as the gloves hit the ice. Then it's just like, this is awesome. I'm, I'm, I want to beat this guy's head in. And it, it's, it's so, I don't know how many people have been in a fist fight, but it's, it's just like, you want to kill somebody and it's so exhilarating. You can't get hurt. And then as soon as it's done, you feel like this, just weight lifted off your shoulders. It's like, yes, now we can, you know, get back to the game. But man, before a game, well, I'd be in Buffalo and we go into Toronto. They're our biggest rivals and there'd be Colt North, there'd be Frazier McLaren. There'd be, um, Frazier, the defenseman. They'd have true Bodie called up. Jamie Devane would be there like that. It's five pretty tough kids. And then Buffalo, I was the only guy there. And this was after I jumped Kessel. So I knew I was in for at least <laughs> one or two fights that game and it's nerve wracking, but it's also exhilarating. Get you going. Right. So it's, uh, 
it's a whole different side of the game that no one even understands. Like it mentally wears on you pretty good. Uh, obviously like the, I can't even imagine what the feeling would be like of 15 to 20,000 people cheering after you win a fight. Could you imagine having to do that job this year when there's no one and it would just oh. be fake crowd noise. It'd be <laughs> yeah, brutal. And then if you got beat up and your teammates yeah. were like, good job, John. Like, yeah, like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <Where'd> <laughs> it go? <laughs> so going into that, I had somebody who found out we were having you on the show and they, I, I, they asked cause it didn't seem like you were afraid of anybody cause you're, a huge monster. Um, <laughs> was there anybody that you were like, you had it circled on the calendar. You were like, this is the one I don't want to do. Steve was McIntyre. Steve McIntyre. Everybody says Steve McIntyre. I think that's fantastic. So okay. big, big Mac was the guy who we never fought for some odd reason. I think I only played against him a handful of times, but again, another story I'll never forget. It was in the tail end of my career. It was in San Jose. Mac had been retired. It was a preseason game. We we're playing Anaheim. I, I pull into the arena I get out of my car and their bus pulls up at the same time. And, you know, it's preseason. So you're pretty friendly with the other guys. McIntyre walks off the bus and my heart just drops. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like this, what? It was like when Ogie Oglethorpe steps on the rink. He's like, I thought he was gone. And he comes off the bus and I'm like, holy cow. Like, what is he doing here? I thought he retired a year and a half ago. And I was somewhat friendly with him. Like, what are you doing here, big boy? He's like, yeah, they just signed me. I don't know. I just literally got off the farm in Saskatchewan. I was like, this is terrible. Sure enough. <laughs> first shift. She's like, let's go big boy. I'm like, absolutely not. Like it's preseason. Like I got nothing to gain here. And that was one of the only times I said no in my career to a fight was to that and preseason and Steve McIntyre. Cause it, the guy was just, <laughs> that's a business decision. It was, you know, I wanted to make a good first impression. I think I beat up Tom Sestito the next game. So I, I made it right. But I was just like, boy, oh boy. He, he was just like an absolute monster who could eat punches and he would put you to sleep with a left. Like uh, he had farm boy strength. It's, it's unbelievable. That guy, he was absolutely like, I wasn't scared to fight Bugard or any of those guys. Mac was the guy. So you said farm boy strength, and this just dawned on me that I have a question about somebody who had farm boy strength. I was watching a video of you and you were with the Houston arrows and you fought nasty Morasti with the Syracuse crunch halfway through that fight. You guys start talking and you continue to talk for most of the rest of the fight. (laughs) What the hell were you guys talking about? Were you trying to give him an out and he just wouldn't take it or what? Well, I was like, I'm like, are you done, man? Like, I'm getting He's tired. Like a bulldog. Because I wasn't even like, I was still new to the fight game, right? Because I was in the AHL. I played college for four years. So I wasn't this seasoned fighter like I was when I got to the NHL. And so I didn't have the power behind my punches like I did later in my career. And so I was hitting him and he just would eat it. I think he was on steroids. <laughs> so like he didn't feel a thing. So he's just getting like, I'm hitting him in the head five, six, seven, eight times. And he's just like, no, no, no. I'm like, John, are you done? Like, you're not going to hit me. And I'm literally telling him this during the fight. He's like, no, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. And the refs are at like, are you guys done? I'm like, yes, I'm done. And John Mraz is like, no, I'm not done. No, I'm not done. <laughs> And I'm like, this guy's an animal. And I, that like, it was crazy how I, you could hit him and he wouldn't feel it. I'm convinced he was on steroids. Like, I don't know your, your relationship with John Morasti. <laughs> no, don't yeah, have he, one. You know, what's funny is, is he, he used to fight Jeremy Yablonski all the time. And this guy yeah. leads into another Cousins. question. I, yeah. So when Jeremy Yablonski played in Edmonton, I got him a job at a place that built modular homes, me and him worked together. And he would like, so I'm wondering if you ever had a job. Cause when, when he, he would come into the lunchroom, guys were just like, freeze up and be like, look at the size of this guy. Like, did you coming up? Did you ever have any jobs where you just walked in and guys couldn't even believe you were there? Well, I'm not like, that's the thing. I'm not phys. If you look, if you see me in person, I'm just tall. I mean, you're like six, nine, right? Like, yeah. So- <laughs> and so my weight's pretty, per- like Yablonski was a, a brick. You know what I mean? Like he was yeah. a thick dude. And so he was in, pro- I, people all always underestimate me. Like, what do you weigh? 230 pounds. I'm like, no, I'm actually 275. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty big, but now I don't know. Uh, not really. Like he's a scary looking dude. If you see him in person, he's got the Mohawk. He's got yeah. I mean, he steroids too. Both of them probably go to the same supplier. I, I wouldn't even be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't but, either. Yeah. No, you wouldn't be scared of me. If you saw me in person, I don't think I'm just teddy bear. <laughs> John, I want to talk about your career coming up a little bit before we brought you onto the pod. We were talking about how it feels like for a lot of enforcers in the NHL, like, 
there was a point in their career where they had to make the decision like, okay, if I want to survive, if I want to make it to the next level, I need to be a fighter. And for every enforcer, there was kind of a point in their career where they were a goal scorer, where they were the best player on their team. For you, like in minor hockey growing up when you were 13, 14, 15, was there ever a point for you where you were the best player on your team? And was there a point where you had to go, I got to be a fighter if I want to make it? Is this, a, are you trying to embarrass me? Is my first interview <laughs> with the nation. You're trying to embarrass me. everybody. honored guest. You're having Chuck. He's the fill it up and novice. He's the <laughs> fill it up and novice. <laughs> no, I've never, the only time I was the best player was I quit travel hockey in peewee major peewee because my coach came in and she wanted us to do off ice training and work out. And I was like, I just don't want to do it. And I remember she came to my door one day because I'd missed the whole team workouts. And she's like, really want you on the team, but you got to come to the high school and run two miles and do like 10 pull-ups and 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups. And we went to the high school and I ran like a quarter of the way around the track. And I was like, I'm done. Like, I, I don't want to do this. This is not fun for me. And so I went and played high school and I went and played house league and I was the best player in, in house league hockey. So that, that was the only time where I was the best player, but any other travel, any other competitive hockey, I was always, you know, third defenseman, fourth defenseman, never really that, you know, never scored. My, my career high, I think, was three goals my, my last year in San Jose. So I'm not like Tyler. I'm not, a, I'm not an offensive junior. You were an all-star. You were an all-star. <laughs> and on your Wikipedia page, it says all-star season. They can't take that away from you. Isn't that so, funny? <laughs> isn't it great? Crazy. So then for you, like, what was the, was the NHL dream still always there for you? No. Well, yeah. Like, obviously, every, like you probably still want to play in the NHL. Like, everybody wants to play. I, I never thought it was ever going to happen, but – the turning point was in college. My coach sat me down. He's like, listen, you can't teach six, eight, man. So if, if you want to make a run at it, you got something that not a lot of people have. So I started to work at my game. I, I got an option to play in the AHL. I, I managed to stick around. The fighting came into it was, it was one of our first, first month of the season. We were playing the Peoria Rivermen and DJ King came in. And before the game, our coaches were like, don't touch him. You know, he's, he's a scary, scary dude. Like he beats guys up and we had some tough guys. We had Jody Tedaranko and he kind of took care of the team. And Joey even came up to me. He's like, don't touch this guy. Just leave him to me. And sure enough, we get tangled up in the first or second period. And I'm like, let's do it. Like, let's see where we're at. And, you know, it was a good fight. Uh, if you ask DJ, he probably said it was a draw. If you ask me, I, I, you know, I won. So it was one of those things where I'd opened my eyes where like, I can hang with these guys. And, uh, I got some attention from Minnesota after that, the wild called, they said, you know what, this kid, you know, he's got some toughness Let's see what he can do. So I, I obviously saw it as an asset. In your first season with the wild, I'm just looking at it right now. You played 20 games. You only had 21 pims though. So like, were, were you just not getting a lot of opportunities to fight Were you maybe hiding? Like why, why was there so few pims in that season kind of compared to the rest? Well, cause I had Bugard, right. And okay. so he, he protected me, he took me under his wing and he, he took a lot of the fights that I, I probably should have had. And I don't know if he was scared for his job. I don't know if he was just worried that I came in and was going to just take, take his uh, spot in the lineup, but worked out for me where I really didn't have to take the heavy load until my second year. Cause uh, I don't think I was ready. I, I don't think I was ready to fight those big, big guys. And he, uh, he really just kind of let me ease into it nice and easy. What would have been your welcome to the NHL moment, whether it's something on the ice? I don't know if it would be a fight, if it was a shift where you looked at the guy and were like, holy shit, I'm playing against this guy or maybe something off the ice. Was there a moment where you kind of went, fuck, I'm in the show right now? Well, my first shift, my first game was versus Detroit. And this is back when they were like just juggernauts. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, winning cups. My first shift, literally, and I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke. It was Datsuk, Zetterberg, and Franson. And then it was Lidstrom and uh, Rafalski on the back end. And I was like, this is incredible. And this is, that was my first shift in the NHL. I'm just like starstruck. And that was the game when Datsuk did his like Datsuk deke on Josh Harding. Mm. Okay. And so oh, it was yeah. one of those games where it was like, well, uh, boy, I don't know if I belong here. It was just, it was a cool experience to have like potentially five Hall of Famers lining up against you. It, it was, it was cool. Yeah. That was my wake up moment. Where I was like, this is like legit. Damn. Um, you did end up, you scored five career goals in the NHL. I'm also curious to know, is there one that stands out? Is there a favorite for you? Is it, do you have a favorite career goal in the NHL? The, well, the, my first one in San Jose was the prettiest one. I, I went shelf on Hopi. Um, another one that year was good because we were playing Calgary 
and I wanted to fight Brandon Bullock and I, I was chasing him around the ice and we were down, I think one or two and he wouldn't fight me, wouldn't fight me. And then the start of the third period, we got on the ice and I scored. I turned right next to him. I was like, are we going to fight now, bitch? And he didn't get a shift after the whole, the whole rest of the game. But it was, it was just so satisfying because the code is like, you're supposed to fight. Like if you're a fighter, you got to give him a go. And so when I scored, I was like, that's what you get. Like, you know, you, you deserve that. So I just thought that was pretty, pretty poetic. <laughs> I got a question for you about what would you rather, like, what did you have more fun doing? Fighting in hockey or being on a nationally watched TV show. You portrayed <sighs> Bobby Strzok, a hockey player who needed, <laughs> who needed protection in the show SWAT. Well, what was that like? It was, it was honestly terrible. <laughs> it, was, it was awful. I hated doing it. So they, they make it seem so glamorous and they fly out to California. It's all great. First class. And then you just sit there. You tie, you like I sat in my gear with these other kids from Canada for a good 12 hours one day and you just sit around and it's not fun. And I was out there for two weeks and it was miserable. Like I do not recommend it. <laughs> I, I, like I don't recommend it at all. The, the guys who I was with, they were like ex junior players, just, you know, their parents are in television or whatever. And they got paid a decent wage. I think they would get like 800 bucks a day to come and just play shinny hockey and sit around and just eat crafts food services all day. So that yeah, food, <laughs> I would do that, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't fun. My it wasn't wife your just, thing, eh? No, and thing. we just well, had a kid. We had a kid before I went out there, and so I think that was number five. And my wife was not happy, so I got home, and she's like, "You, you, you never again. Like you're never." Is leaving. this so, is this something we should dig deeper on, John Scott, the actor? No, not a chance. <laughs> not no, because okay. they're doing a movie on me, Disney, and. Yeah, they're like, would you like something? I'm like, I don't want to be in it. I don't want to be near it. I got enough stuff going on. So no, not going to happen. Never, ever. What, okay. What's the process like in that movie then? Like how, like you said, you don't want to be close to it. So like, are you really involved in it? Or no. How did that even come up? They, they've been asking me, well, it's been in the works for a while. Disney bought it, I think uh, five months ago. So now they're making it and I don't want to be involved in it. I just say, here's my address. You can send me a check. And I'll watch it when it comes out. That's all. That's honestly. a film script written by Mitch <laughs> Album. I mean, Will yeah. Arnett, Hugh Jackman. My goodness. So it's Hugh Jackman? a good movie. No, they, they were in discussions for it, but they wanted you to play like the, they wanted you to play the lead role. They or wanted what? me to be in it at some point. Like, you know, in the, I, I thought it'd be cool if I could beat myself up, you know, <laughs> but there's not a fighting scene in the movie. So I don't know. <laughs> that I think would it'd be, be great cool. if at some point there's just like an extra where you can be like a concession worker, I but you're my in, head in. <laughs> yeah, just like pop your head in and it's like the movie about John Scott. And he's just kind of in the background. Yeah, it's for like Stan it. Lee. Like uh, my hockey yeah, fight stuck on hat on. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so who's playing you? Who has the honor of playing John Scott? Who has the stature of playing John? Well, Scott? Well, that's the tricky part with these movies is the actors are hard to nail down, but like, yeah, like the article said, I think Hugh, they've been in talks for a few months now, so he might be the, the golden ticket winner, but we'll see. I don't want to, wow. let the <laughs> like I said, that's I stay awesome. out of it as best I can. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's cool. They give me an update every like four or five months. Mitch will call me and be like, Hey, this is where we're at. I mean, that's great. So if you didn't play hockey, would you be engineering buildings for a big firm right now? You have Probably. a mechanical engineering firm. Hey, Probably. Or a, a mechanical engineering degree. I mean, that's, that's yeah. smart. That's big time stuff. Well, I, I went to Michigan tech and there's two degrees you can get engineering or business. And most of the hockey guys took business and I'm like, I'm not going to play hockey after, you know, this, so I might as well get a useful degree. Not that business is not useful, but yeah, it's pretty useless. So mechanical engineering is a little more specialized. It's, it's, a little more I'm specialized. pretty smart. Is that, yeah. I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, you know, I, I probably, I, my goal was just to get the degree and go home back to St. Catharines and, you know, work, work with Ford and be done with it. That was, that was the uh, end game for me. Wow. And then somehow you found a way, like, how does that break? Like, how do you go? Things like, just keep head? changing. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, how does it be like, oh, I'm going to go home, work for Ford to like, what did it feel like you just blinked? And like a couple of years later, it's like, oh shit, I'm in the NHL. Actually plans changed. <laughs> it was really strange. Yeah. So I left school and I didn't have many offers. You see guys come out of college, they go right to the show and they're just like tearing it up. I got an East coast deal one way. Um, I signed an AHL deal kind of 10 games into my contract. And then I was just in the AHL and then it just kind of snowballed where Minnesota was 
Bugard got hurt and then they needed some toughness and I just happened to be there and I went up and I played. I, it was so bizarre. Like I, I, I could not, I don't know, Tyler, I have no idea. It just worked <laughs> out perfectly. Honestly, <laughs> I'm very fortunate because I, I honestly, I'm not that skilled. I'm not that good. I just hit a perfect spot where they're like, we need somebody you're tall, like come and do this job. The, the year next, it could have been Matt Cassian because he came after me and yeah. he, you know, it just, I just kind of hit that sweet spot. And then it just it was a kind of a, it just went from there. Uh, before we let you go here, I want to talk a little bit more about the podcast and some hockey stuff. So it's like, it's partnered with hockeyfights.com, but it is not a podcast solely dedicated to hockey fights. Obviously you guys do have great guests. I've been seeing the guest list that you've had on in the past. You do give your opinion on a lot of stuff from around the league. So give us sort of the Coles notes version. If someone's never listened to the podcast before, what should they be expecting and dropping with the, and dropping the gloves? Yeah. It's just like you said, it's, we kind of just touch on everything. We obviously talk about the big stories. I do have a good relationship with a lot of the boys in the league still. So we have good guests and we just keep it loose. We're not all fights, but that is a big part of our show just because it was a big part of my career. And we just kind of touch on everything. I, I talk about my family life. I got a pretty unique family. I got six daughters. You know, I, uh, I've lived a unique life, I think. So it's uh, it's a good show. It's, we definitely keep it, uh, we keep it light. We're PG. We're not like the other podcasts out there who are effing and Jeffing and talking about this and that we, we keep it family friendly. And I find that's, uh, that works for me. I, I can't be swearing to my house. I got five kids right on the other side of this door. I can't be, uh, <laughs> speaking of your five, bombs. speaking of your five kids, you have five daughters, six okay. daughters, six daughters, six, six daughters. Six. Now there's only five so there's... outside the door right now, Chris, I got six so, in total. So they stand <laughs> zero chance at ever having a boyfriend. If they, cause None. It's... Wife, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to go to jail for the first one for a couple months and then <laughs> save the other five. Yeah. The, the news will get out. They don't mess with these guys, kids. So it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good thing. They're good kids. Oh. I'm don't even, I don't know. Anyways, that's another episode for another day. <laughs> that's another episode. <laughs> Do they have any daughter, interest have in hockey jobs? Just about six daughters. What's Anyways, that? Sorry. Is that you could have a whole podcast based on how to raise six daughters, because that is, Probably the hardest thing you'll ever do. It would be all wrong answers. (laughs) (laughs) What not to do. Uh, I was saying, do they have any interest in hockey? Are they, are they getting into that? Yeah. My oldest is nine. So they're still fairly young. Like they're nine, seven, five, five, three, and like seven, eight months. So we, we skate, we skate a lot and they're on the ice. We've just kind of introducing sticks and pucks, but it's, it's, you guys are so lucky to be in Canada where you can just throw them in a league and there's 10 different teams they can play against on any given night Mm -hmm. here. It's kind of strange. I'm in Northern Michigan where there's not many girls hockey players. So if I do want them to get into it, I'm going to have to really branch out to Detroit or Sioux, Ontario, and just kind of travel. And it's like, I don't want to travel. Like, no, thanks. Like, I don't know. We'll see. They like it though. They like it just as good as they like ballet. I don't know what that says. Good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, uh, dropping the gloves. It's on hockeyfights.com Now you, uh, you and Tim, you drop new episodes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, correct? That is correct. Yes, sir. Check it out. Beautiful. It's a good podcast. Beautiful, John. Absolutely. If you like the Real Life Podcast, you will love dropping the gloves. Thanks for giving us some time today. Appreciate it. All right, fellas. Let's do it again. Absolutely. All right, there you go. That is uh, former NHLer John Scott, host of Dropping the Gloves. Uh, I edited that down a little bit, but after we ended the recording part of it, we had another great chat with him about football and scavenger oh, yeah. hunts. We're having him on. We got to have him. Yeah, well, he's he's going to come on just, you know, because he wants to, to promote the show, so He's going to come on, but he wants to come on just like be one of us and be an analyst yeah. and not be grilled in interviews. No, so I love the question. Good. The question he asks when we're done recording, he goes, so, so what is this? And I was kind of like, <laughs> you know what? I ask myself that question a lot too. That's so funny. That dude, like, so pretty much every time we talk to an ex NHL or somebody like Frank Saravelli, like you have a little bit of nerves going into it. That guy crushed the nerves within like four oh, seconds. I yeah. don't think I've ever felt as easy talking to somebody as I talk, as, as I was talking to him. God, that, he'd be so fun to just go for beers with because like, oh, he's, yeah. he, he's, he's so kind and personable and like, obviously like very well-spoken. Like, yeah, we got to get him on. He's got to be like a guest host one time where we just like have an episode where he's just contributing to it. That, that, just, like, that's what I, that's what I think. I, honestly, a guy like him, I think he would have, preferred i mean obviously on the very first time we ever have him on we have to talk hockey fighting i mean we just do but even yeah. at the end of that he says like i'd like to talk about anything else other than me and i just like i bet these guys just 
live for that kind of shit, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about what's happening in other sports that they, that they find interesting or just things in life. Like, the Golden uh, Globes. We could probably, we probably, he probably would have had some takes on the Zoom and the Golden Globes last night. That guy seems <laughs> like he's got takes on everything. He said once a month. We'll bring him in once a month, and he'll be one of these tiles on the Zoom call, and he's going to be driving your M Chuck cra- crazy as he also takes the show off the rails. <laughs> if Hey, listen, John Scott might be the only guy I can't get mad at if he comes in and takes the shows off the rails because he'll drive up That's your true. So he's from Edmonton originally. And he yeah. still has some family here. So he says he does come here once in a while. So it'll be awesome. Like obviously post COVID uh, when travels opened up, if he, if he could come here and we could do an event with him, that'd be unreal. Will his six foot nine frame fit in our basement studio? <laughs> <laughs> Ceilings oh, aren't even tall enough. I'm like six yeah. two, and I drill my well, no, head on the but, ceiling in there. We'll, we'll hopefully yeah, be in yeah. the new building by then. Will we not? Yeah, we should be in the new building by oh, then. There you go. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, built for John Scott in mind. Yeah, before we keep uh, plugging along here, need to give some love to our friends over at manscaped.com who are sticking around to sponsor the Real Life Podcast. You get 20% off with the promo code Real Life at manscaped.com. We've been talking about the, uh, and this is the terminology I'm going to choose to use here, the big package with sort of everything involved in it there. They have a ton of great stuff, though, at manscaped.com, not just the performance package, with the peak hygiene plan, which I've been plugging for the last few weeks. But if you want to check down a little bit, they also have the perfect package 3.0. That one is 140 bucks, but then you use the promo code real life, gets you another 20% off, gets you the lawnmower, the crop preserver, the crop reviver, the magic mat, the shed, and a pair of boxers. So pretty much everything except for the ear and nose hair trimmer that the other one had, it's a little bit cheaper. And again, free shipping, 30 day money back guarantee with the promo code real life over at manscaped.com. If all you want to get is the lawnmower 3.0, that one is 120 bucks with of course, 20% off on top of that promo code real life. So check out our friends at manscaped.com. I want to, I I want to jump in. Sorry about that. I just want to thank everyone, all our listeners for supporting the brands that come and support the podcast. So manscaped gave us a trial. They're now renewing. Twig, Twig and Berries gave us a trial and now that they're renewing. Uh, and these sponsors are very important for us to help build yeah. and, and continue on this podcast and, you know, be able to do things with John Scott and have him come on the podcast and all that kind of stuff. So it means a lot to us. So I just really want to just from the business side or just from the heart from both, I guess, is that I just want to say thank you because, you know, your reaction to this and support of all this uh, is allowing us to do a lot of good things. So thank you. Yeah. All that stuff. Like, I mean, the nation beer, everything, like when we promote this stuff, one, it's great. It's they're great products. Like I honestly love my nutsack underwear from twig and berries promo code mm-hmm. is, uh, what is the pro- nation 15 gets you 15% off. I almost fumbled the promo code, but I like, I love my nutsack underwear. So we get to promote it. And then when the listeners support it too, like it just, it's yeah. almost like an ecosystem, right? Everybody can support everyone. We can keep making the podcast. The sponsors are happy. So we're happy. And hopefully the listeners are happy as well. And the manscape stuff has been great as well. They sent us some and I cannot get over. Oh boy. I hope my family doesn't listen to this line. The feeling of my balls after I use it. I love it. Yeah, it's very small. Wow. wow. One other That's, thing, uh, for hey, John hey, Scott, Chuck, please, uh, please just clip that audio, that one, that little, <laughs> little thing that you just said and send that over to bag milk and myself, please. Yep. Chalmers. One thing for John Scott, uh, if you want to support us again, support him, go to his Twitter account at John Scott underscore 32. He posts a lot of good videos. He posts a lot of good updates for his podcast. Uh, it's where you get, you, you see a lot of good stuff from him. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't post anything that doesn't have some sort of like, you know, meaning. So yep. it's not going to like ruin your timeline. It's a good follow. Beautiful. And, uh, Scott and, and, and support John Scott, the actor and download or stream <laughs> SWAT wherever the, you can. Honestly, the movie that's being produced about him is a big deal. Like, the dude that wrote it's a big deal. The people that they're going to try to get to play him is a big deal. The production company, Disney owning it, it's a big deal. Uh, the fact that he doesn't want to be a part of it, it kind of blows my mind. I mean, that would be. I know. It, it's probably, probably yeah. Uh, but it I, sounds I, like, I, oh, I mean, it sounds like he had like a bad experience in his first foray into TV. And so maybe he's just like, if every day on this set is like this, what the hell would I want to be a part of this, especially when I got six kids at home? You know, and yeah. something else I can do. I don't know. 
What Six if you Jack well. plays them? Man, Six that daughters. is like, how do you not feel like you're the coolest guy in the world? And this, and this is all speculation because we're not sure yet. Mm-hmm. But if Hugh Jackman played me in a movie, I would feel like the king. Podcast like, idea. That's high praise. We get, if that ever comes to fruition, episode of Dropping the Gloves where it's Hugh Jackman and John Scott. And it's John, it's like a character lesson, right? It's yes. John, Hugh Jackman learning Ooh. how to be like John Scott. Yes. Yeah. Who is, who's the real John Scott? <laughs> Uh, good stuff. Um, oh, fuck. I had someone else to say, and then I didn't write it down. I'm such a dumbass. Oh, I had an idea for stuff we should sell on nationgear.caj. That's what it was. It's unrelated to the podcast completely. That's um, real life. How come? Okay. So if you remember when we went to Vegas, which was a year ago today, it is insane oh, that that was a year ago I, today. I tweeted, I tweeted one year ago today. I was extremely hungover. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I remember sitting, we woke up at like whatever, 9 a.m. Vegas time, the, the after the first night we were there. And I woke up and I was rooming with Nick and then one of my buddies. And I cracked a like king can of a Bud Light seltzer at 9 a.m. And I was like, all right, time to record the real life podcast. And yeah. we sat in the hotel room and recorded it. That was so much fun. We should, um, re- we should re-release that episode because it got, that one went way off the rails. Actually, don't. Yeah, no, we should not. Um, okay. But my question was when we were there, the Utah boys, remember they made us drinking glasses with the Oilers yep. nation logo sandblasted into there. And it has become my tradition when I'm at home to watch an Oilers game, I pour a beer in my Oilers nation cup. It feels good. It feels like a good tradition for me to have. How come nation gear doesn't sell like Oilers nation drinkware? Like, I feel yeah, like yeah. there would be a market for that. I feel like Oilers fans like me would love to sit down and pour their drinks in their Oilers Nation themed cup or like, okay, have your coffee right. in the mornings in your Oilers Audience. Nation mug. Audience, you let me know if you want glassware, whether it be a coffee mug, whether it be a koozies. glass koozies. We do have uh, Dog Island made some collab nation beer koozies for us, but we could do just Oilers Nation koozies. You let me know. And I will make it happen. There you go. If you want have to be, Nation drinkware, let us know. They have to be those ones, though, that fit like a can and a half of yeah, 20 of ounces. A can of, yeah, 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 the bigger ones. I, I hate those mm-hmm. ones where literally a, a can of beer just fits in there. And if you mm-hmm. pour any with a bit of head, like, it's just awful. Yeah, make sure it's the big ones. And yeah. I want a cut. It was what, do we, <laughs> what do we think about tonight's <laughs> game? Should we, should we finish up talking about what we think for our bets for tonight's game? Yep, that's a good way to go quickly. Once again, I'm going to quickly plug our friends at twigandberries.ca. If you want to be comfortable while you're watching the Oilers, why not check out their nutsack underwear? They got some new arrivals. I'm looking at the red plaid one right now, and I think I would look good in it, and I think our listeners would as well. Promo code is nation15 at twigandberries.ca. Gets you 15% off. They got free shipping in Canada, over 100 bucks, or free local delivery in St. Albert, which I love as a St. Albert resident. The game tonight, Oilers against the Leafs, the betting report, which I give on my pregame podcast as well, courtesy of our friends at oddshark.com. I'm getting all the sponsor reads in. Uh, The Oilers, they started this game as dogs, I believe. Yeah, they opened at plus 100, but they've now flipped. That line has jumped. The Oilers are now favorites, and I think that would be because of the Matthews news. Sounds like he's not going to play, according to Mark Spector. And the news that Jack Campbell won't start. It'll be Michael Hutchinson between the pipes. So I actually like the Oilers in this one. The goaltending matchup favors them. They're missing. The Oilers haven't lost two in a row since January. You should always like the Oilers. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, where I'm seeing it, I'm still seeing that the Oilers are a slight favorite. Right now, they're minus 103. And the Leafs are minus 114. Oh, um, wow. so the Oilers are dogs then. Yeah, still dogs. No, no. But they're, it's, no they're favorite at minus 113. Oh, no, they are dogs. No, yeah, 103 right, and 114. Yeah. So, yeah. but the one that gets me is um, normally when you have a will or will not score bet, guys like Dry Side Limit David were always in the we're always in the minus. Um, and but tonight they're in the plus. And I don't see two bad games coming from them. Wait, and, where are they in the plus for points? Like over one uh, and a half for, points for score will or oh, will not goal. score. So Connor McDavid is a plus one ten to score. Leon Drysdale is a plus one twenty five, and I saw for a couple games there where they were, you know, it, a minus. The most it would have shifted to would have been I think McDavid. They might have been minus one ten at one point. But you're right. The the one twenty five on Drysdale I think is better odds than you'd usually get. So I think you have a point there. After seeing you know how emotional Connor was on the bench just after most of those shifts and how pissed off he was, I don't see. I mean, I don't, I don't ever expect those two to have two bad games in a row. And so buddy, 
I got. I, I think I'm going to pump both these Will scores. McDavid and Drysaddle have not been held without a point in two straight games all season. So I'm going my pregame podcast, better the game, which by the way, if people aren't listening to, I know in the past it's always been hashtag fade your rum chuck, but I'm actually doing really good on it this year. My record on the year is 13 and 10 and I'm up one and a half units. Um, my pregame podcast, better the game today is McDavid over one and a half points paying even money. Oh, I would take it one step further. You saw Connor at the end of the game, sitting on the bench, staring as they celebrate with, Jack Campbell, he was just death staring that. And that was just fueling angry Connor. I think you got to get Connor at over two and a half plus 470. Add that I was wallet. just looking at that, buddy. I was just, I'm literally looking at it with my mouse hovering it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It. Cause it's Hit not, it. I mean, Hit the it. value value on, on McDavid right now for points. I mean, it's a minus 455 to get a point. But that two and a half, like even Tyson Berry. Tyson Berry point. Always like, a good, always a good bet. It's always a good bet. But yeah, over under two and a half points. God, McDavid and Dreisaitl. I might hammer both those instead of the will will not score. You know what's amazing is Connor to not get a point is plus 300. That's well, so crazy. <laughs> so I was doing the math on that and I was trying to figure out like throughout the year, if you put a hundred dollars on McDavid to get a point every game, like would it actually be worth it? And the, I, the, the last time I actually went through and like calculated it throughout the year was about two weeks ago. And you actually, if you were to bet a hundred bucks on McDavid to get a point every single night, you would actually only be up like $15 or something like that. Like it was crazy. Yeah. The odds are so juiced against him. Yeah. They are, but that's why you have to take advantage of nights like tonight. You know what I mean? Uh, you, you know, hopefully you didn't bet anything last game, but if you, oh, I wish. if you hammer, if you hammer that two and a half tonight, that, that, I don't know. Some, some, something in my mind feels like it's going to be like one of those five, four games where they're in on like every goal, <laughs> you yeah. know? And yeah. Connor, Connor's finally playing plus again for, well, maybe it was before, but over three and a half shots. Yeah. I saw that. Um, he's mad. He's, so he's, mad. he's motivated. He only had one uh, dry settle hit his shot prop the other day. Cause his odds have dropped down a tick. Now they're minus minus one thirty nine for over two and a half shots. That was my pregame podcast better the game last time, but earlier in the year, you would have been getting like minus minus one eighty, minus minus one ninety on that dry settle prop. So the odds have shifted a bit on those uh, shots. Even the nude shot is lower than it's been in a while here. Um, so Remember, a couple do you have any, notes. do you have any speculation on dry's kind of nagging injury in terms of what it is? I don't know what it is. We're like, we keep hearing like the little chirps from different media guys. Like, ah, he might be fighting something and he might. But the reason I almost, I don't think it's a serious issue is because they kept playing him towards the end of last game. Like when it was four, nothing with 10 minutes to go, he was getting a regular shift. And there's a part of me that goes, if this was anything significant, you don't play him. Right. Like when you're down for nothing, you go, Hey, let him rest. Just give him this one off. So the fact that he's still playing, I think he was at morning skate today as well. Like I, that's why I don't think it's as serious as maybe some people might be thinking it is anyways. Okay. That's going to do it for episode 260 of the Real Life Podcast. Big shout out to John Scott. If you haven't been keeping up to date with the new podcast we are adding to the network, John Scott dropping the gloves. It's usually only about 30, 40 minutes, so it's quick, easy to digest. It drops every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And also the DFO Rundown. If you haven't listened to that yet, you absolutely should. We just had former Oiler and current Minnesota Wild GM Bill Guerin on the podcast uh, today, actually. So that one's out. Also, last Friday, we had Bruce Boudreaux on the pod, and holy shit, was he good. Did you know he was in the movie Slapshot? Yeah. Not just in the movie, pretty big part of it. And the team he played for, like the Independent League team, he played with the Hanson brothers when they were the Carlson brothers. The team he was on is the team that the movie is based off of. So he had some great stories. He has another good story. The scene in Slapshot where Paul Newman is laying on the bed with the dog to shoot that scene. They, I shouldn't be ruining all the stories from the DFO rundown, but I'll tease this one. They walked into the dressing room and were like, we need to shoot the scene with Paul Newman. We need the grossest, most disgusting apartment. This team has. And everyone in the room turned to a young Bruce Boudreaux and were like his apartment. 
that's the one you use. So that scene is actually Bruce Boudreaux's apartment. He shared some great slap shot stories. He was a fucking beauty. How, how many F bombs? I actually think he was pretty clean. I'm yeah. trying to think. It's because he's on. It's because he's trying to get the, the Seattle job. He's, uh, he's yeah. going nuts. Yeah. Gregor also asked him if he's uh, ever seen the GIF. You know the one where it's clearly Boudreaux, like saying the F word, and but it, the caption is just darn. Yeah, yeah, Bruce yeah. about that. Bruce had a funny answer there too. So uh, he's got a bunch of cool stories. So DFO rundown drops every Monday and Friday mornings, uh, mountain time, Eastern time. It'd be more in the afternoon, but uh, those are the new podcasts. You should check them out. Uh, I can't believe we didn't get to the golden globes. What the heck? We always run out of time for the stuff I want to talk about. What did you want to talk about with the golden globes? Not really. anything. it's kind of a joke, kind of a, <laughs> I mean, it was funny. I mean, if you watched it, it was, I've never seen a setup for people to get caught doing dumb shit as that one. They kept oh, going yeah. to people on their Zoom cameras at some of the worst times. Basically, if I was one of those actors or actresses, you had to just sit and stare at the camera with a smile on the whole time or risk <laughs> becoming a meme. Like I, yeah. I saw Bill Murray come on in a Hawaiian shirt about 10 minutes into the thing. Five seconds after he's trending on Twitter, you know, it's, it was and, and it's like, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen loses the first um, best actor in, um, in, in a movie. And Isla Fisher, she's clearly just dis disappointed, right? And she's looking down and I'm just going and everybody else is smiling, big fake smiles. And I don't think she knows she's on camera. Right. And it's just like, I just looked at my, I said, this is, this is just awful for these people. This is like, you know, something bad is going to happen. Now, nothing too bad happened, but it was interesting to watch them at home. The, the banter, you know, to see Jason Sudeikis in a, in a, in a hoodie all of a sudden become a thing. I mean, it's just, it was wild. It was wild. And I thought it was great. And I couldn't take my eyes off it. And, you know, everybody else is saying how awful it was for those reasons, but I actually thought it was great for those reasons. I'm uh, I'm happy. I was happy for Shit's Creek. Good Canadian show. Yeah, uh, yep. created by two. Well, I guess created by two Canadian legends, but featuring like another a third, Catherine O'Hara. Uh, that was phenomenal to see. And also, I was stressed out because they weren't getting love until I think it went to the best actress, the Queen's Gambit. If you haven't seen it. It is so fucking good, and it makes you want to play chess. That's how so, good it is. Can I ask you a question, Jared? Did you get the joke right off the bat when Catherine O'Hare won Best Actress for Schitt's Creek? Did you get the joke that her husband was playing on her? So first, she, he played a recording of an applause, right? Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was kind of playing over her, and you kind of were like, what is he doing? Like, is this just yeah. an old man with technology? But then he shut it down. And then you could see him trying to find something else on his phone and as she's talking and then all of a sudden he starts playing something else and it's music because I had been saying, how are they going to play people off when there's, when their, their um, speeches get too long. Right. Yeah. And so he, and I think they had rehearsed, like talked about this, you start to play me off. And so yeah. he starts to play the music and she's like looking at him, giving him stern looks. And, and I could tell right away that it was a bit, but I was, yeah, but, cause she started but, singing. But, but no, but even, yeah. So did you know it was a bit right from the jump? No, initially I was like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, cause I'm like, is he piping this into the phone? So she knows if she's gone too long. And then, yeah, like, it, yeah, and, I, and I was like, this is so weird. But then she started singing to the music and I was like, is yeah. this a bit? Yeah. No. And so I was like, Oh my God, he's going to get killed for this. Anyways, we've lost your, your job. Wake up. What's up? Nothing. Okay. I was so zoned out for that Golden Globes talk. <laughs> no, it's fine. Hey, it's fine. Seems like we don't have to talk about any more Golden Globes. Oilers Leafs tonight should be a good one. Jay, you going live on Instagram with the pregame pregame show right away as well, right? Uh, yeah, we're going to go uh, at four o'clock. Beautiful. Well, if you haven't tuned into that yet, it's available on all of our live streaming stuff. So Facebook, Twitter, Twitch as well. And I think YouTube live, it pops up on there. So uh, you can check out their pregame pregame show or my pregame podcast. Tons of stuff. Check them both out. The yeah. Why not? Check them both out. Get my pregame podcast. Yeah. Better the game. My laptop's about to die. So I got to wrap this up. Episode 260 of the real life podcast brought to you by Oodle Noodle, Twig and Berries and our friends at Manscaped. It's over. Great job on making it through the entire hour of the real life podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from.